you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Hello, hello. Joining me today is Maddie Spear, a licensed clinical social worker in North Carolina. Maddie holds a bachelor's degree in social work from Baylor University, a master's degree in social work from UNC Chapel Hill, a license in clinical social work, and over five years working as a social worker in a variety of settings. Before beginning her private practice, she worked in foster care agencies, human trafficking safe safe homes, refugee mental health clinics, and mental health advocacy centers. She also holds a specialized certification in TFCBT, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. In addition to her work her work in direct trauma care, she strives to bring mental health tips and relief worldwide through a modern mental health approach. With a, a following of over 200,000 on social media, she aims to eliminate the stigma around mental health and promote healing for all with accessible mental health tips and tricks to promote self-growth and self-care. All right, so... Natty and I talk about what it's like to show up on social media as a therapist, which deep dives us into a conversation that you know I love around mental health and content creation. We talk about teens, tweens, social media, mental health, and some do's and don'ts for parents, specifically when it comes to communicating with their teens and tweens. Maddie shares some of her past work experiences, including her time in Thailand. We also take a good amount of time to talk about trauma. So as always, stay tuned after for my final thoughts and here's Maddie. Hey Maddie, so nice meeting you. Thank you for being here. Hey guys, thank you for having me. I am so excited for our talk today. Yeah, I I am too because I've been watching you. <laughs> Not in a creepy way, but in the way that you intend for people to watch you on social media now for the better part of at least a year, if not more. It's just wild, isn't it? Like that I would just know you and see you and it's crazy. <laughs> I am honored. I am so blown away by people who are saying, oh yeah, I've like watched you for a significant amount of time. I'm like, why? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I am floored and honored and I just appreciate it. Thank you for sticking with me to, through all this process. Yeah. I, I, you know, did you set out to do what's happened for you on TikTok and just like growing this large following and being this big voice for mental health out there? Absolutely not. No, (laughs) I I started actually on social media and TikTok on a whim and a fluke. It was something to pass time when I was bored in the quarantine world of COVID when everything was just happening and made a few posts and videos about what I do and what my passion is around therapy and mental health. And they took off and I said, oh, well, let me keep going with this. And yeah. here we are. It's, it's been a wild ride, but a beautiful journey too. Yeah. What, what has surprised you most about that mm-hmm. journey with particularly, I guess, TikTok is where it's really blown up. I feel like so much depending on the day, my mm-hmm. hands very much vary. I think what I have been surprised by, at least on my side of the, the growth and the content creation and all that fun stuff, is how much people are looking for normalization of mental health mm-hmm. and how much people are saying, yes, I have other things that are going on and I realize I'm not the only one and how much people need that well, the normalization, but also the hope that you're not alone and there is hope for your story. There are resources for you in that. And it's been really sweet along the way to say, 
I might be able to be a resource to at least point them in a different direction to say, yeah, here's where you can find better hope. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Since it was not necessarily your intention to be, you know, as big as you are, right? How has managing the different transitions gone for you? Like from no followers to, oh, cool, I'm getting some traction. Or was it overnight? Like, how do you, how did you manage that? Yeah, it was both, I felt like all and nothing. And even Mm -hmm. now I'm still hitting milestones, which I did not think I would reach at all. Um, I think right now, a couple of days ago, I may have hit 200,000 followers on TikTok, which I remember when I first hit 10,000 and I was like, this is the biggest deal in the world. I'm perfectly content here. And this just means everything to me. And the fact that I have very bad at math, but I guess 20 times that or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I can't, we're in the same boat here. Um, it's, it is both overwhelming and humbling. And, and it's beautiful that people are willing to seek help and seek resources for what they are needing in their life. Um, and, oh, your original question was so good. And I'm, I know I trailed off. Um, do you mind repeating it? Sure. Just, I guess, how you've managed the uh, the, the growth and like, just, yeah, like not intending to be this big voice. And now you are like, I don't know what's come up. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's been very much um, a process I didn't, uh, did not expect. Um, and I feel like I've managed it in different ways. I think there's absolutely some excitement that comes with it. And then there's also some overwhelm that comes with it of, oh my goodness, I need to make sure that I can be this best support for individuals. So depending on the day, depending on what's going on in my own mental health and my own processing, um, it can feel like a myriad of different things, but it has been sweet because I've been able to, I think, grow this platform and then also grow my connections with people who do follow me. So I have so many people who kind of continue to engage on lives or comment on my TikToks or even Instagram, and I get to know them a little bit. It's kind Mm -hmm. of fun. And so we'd be able to build that connection with certain people has just been such a joy. And I mean that because I can then know what's what's a little bit going on in their lives and become in a way, losing this term very loosely here, but like internet friends. Yeah. And so I'm not able to provide that therapeutic support for them, but we get to celebrate their little wins and their victories and their progress along the way. Even if it's as simple as like, hey, I bought something I was really like looking forward to saving up for. Yeah. Uh, it's been really sweet. So to kind of answer your question, how have I managed the transitions? It depends. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's been really sweet to engage with the people who like you have been along for the ride and it's just, it's so much fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I I feel like, you know, particularly through the pandemic and and in these last years, mental health therapists are more willing to come out on social media and talk about what's going on. You know, have you encountered anyone who's been like, Hey, you're a therapist. You shouldn't be doing this. (laughs) Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm laughing because yes. I, I mean, even when we first started, um, I say we, I mean myself, when I first started the platform, I even felt that for myself of why am I a therapist who is online and how do I balance the ethics around this, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do I show that I'm a therapist? Um, I'm a therapist who sees a therapist <laughs> and I'm also a person who needs mental health support, but I also have this online presence now. How do I manage all of that together? And so it, yeah, it, it's, I've had a lot of pushback, I think towards the beginning, and I've had a lot of pushback internally too, mm-hmm. of how can I make sure that I'm doing right by my profession and right by the people that are supporting this journey for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's been something that I've even had to personally work through of why do I deserve to be here? And is this right as a therapist for me to embark on this journey? Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, you know, you come around to, yes, it's right for me to be here. Right. And, and so what is, do you have like a vision in mind for where you would take this? Like, is it, I don't know, does, does Maddie have like a five-year social media plan or I don't know. I probably should. <laughs> I probably should. Um, I did not think it would last. I guess it's been two and a half years. I so 
this to me is is something and I can get into this a little bit too but it started off like I said as more of a fun thing and then once I realized that there was traction this became a thing to keep me in my profession um it became a a way to engage creatively with the mental health world around me because before where I'm at now is a different place than I was um in my career I was at another mental health agency which I loved working for but it got to a place where I was getting burnt out quick during doing due to all the people that were in the agency. Mm-hmm. COVID was changing so much. Uh, uh, management was changing so much. And it, it, they were really pushing me to a place of burnout. So TikTok actually helped me engage more of my creative side, which uh, if you had asked me to describe myself in three words, creative would be one of them. Mm-hmm. So I, I was missing that a lot. So it started off as a fun thing. And once it gained traction, it was something that brought me out of a place of burnout to a place of this breathes new life into my profession and my career. So it is something that I potentially should think about to have a plan, but it's also been something that as long as it is serving the people who are following me well, as long as I am doing right by the world of mental health and therapy, Mm -hmm. and as long as it's not a a burden to my own process and mental health, then it's something I keep planning on doing. But Right now I have goals in mind, but they're all kind of short term or six months to a year out. Okay. I don't have anything long term, but I kind of like it that way. Okay. No, but I mean that's that's major because yeah. so much of what I I, you know, talk to people too that are like creating content and this and that. And one of the biggest things is if you're not feeling it, that's the first thing that's gonna come through. The content's not gonna hit. And it's going to start to feel like one of those things you should do rather than something you want to do. And, and so it doesn't sound like, I'm sure you've had days where it's like, "Eh, I don't know if I feel like this, but overall, it's not a should, it's truly fulfilling for you to have that outlet. Absolutely. And I think at the beginning, when I would say the first year of creating, there was this like internal and external pressure to say, okay, I have to create post three times or more a day. Mm-hmm. I have to create daily, go live. I was going live literally five days a week. Wow. Um, I was pushing myself in ways and it was fun for me, partly because we didn't have anything else to do, right? We were yeah. in the COVID world and we were staying at home as I said, might as well. And then it got to a point where after probably eight months or so of just like nonstop, I was like, oh, I'm feeling it. Mm. Um, and then there was that kind of internal wrestle of, do I stop content? No, I like it. But I also know that the pace I'm going at isn't enough, but will people still have traction if it's an, if it's not this much and mm-hmm. all the back and forth. And I think about a year, maybe to a year and a half in, about a two and a half years now, I realized this is also for me yeah. and I got to have to take control over it a little bit and like I tell my clients all the time if something is overwhelming for you but you enjoy it let's find a way that you can keep enjoying it how can we bring back control of the situation how can we bring back what originally kept you in this trajectory yeah so I've gotten to a point now where I'm very comfortable saying hey if this is fun for me I'm going to post today if it's not a burden for me I'm going to post today and then it really creates a new enjoyment around it that says this is, of course, for the people who are watching, but also I'm enjoying this too. And it's not a burden for that. Yeah, totally. Is there anything about your experience creating content that you wish your followers were more aware of or more in tune to? So if you question. had all your followers listening right now and you're just like, you know, guys, if you could just like know this one thing about what it's like. I do. I didn't at first, but now I do. So it's a great question. Um, I'd like people to know I'm human too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is I'm going to mess up at times. I am not this person on a pedestal. I don't ever claim to be. Um, and I don't think people think of me as that at all, but I think it's important to know that there are times where my own mental health will get in the way, or there are times where I might misunderstand a situation and not, present it in the best light. And I recognize that, right? Like I, I know that I mess up. I know that I am not, you know, the only face of therapy, nor should I be. Mm-hmm. I'm someone who really enjoys what I do both in social media and out of it with my therapy job, but I'm also human. Yeah. And sometimes I'm not going to meet all the expectations. And so if I had to tell anyone that it's that, is that yeah. at times I think creators need some grace too, that we're going to mess up 
But as long as there's a learning and correction from that, then I think it makes it okay. Yeah, totally. I, I think, you know, just especially in recent years, just the pressure to respond even to every social, every political, everything. It's like, if you respond, there are going to be people, people that are unhappy with how you respond. If you don't respond, people are unhappy that you don't respond. If you try to take a very, very big topic into a 15 second short for video response, it's like, dude, like <laughs> something somewhere has got to give a little bit. We can't, you know, we can't be relying on creators to always be giving opinions and to be doing it in such short versions like it's 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 too much absolutely and we have to think of how it's impacting them too and and I know that can be a um like a potentially somewhat selfish thing to say but I always say you're allowed to be appropriately selfish at times you're allowed to take what you need from certain circumstances so Um, Like there's been absolutely events that in the news have been difficult for me to process internally. Mm -hmm. So it's even harder to process externally with other people. So I've I've learned in the past, I think six months to a year to say, kind of what I said earlier about the timing of posts, but also to say, I'm allowed to feel what I'm feeling. And if Mm -hmm. I can present that in a way that's helpful for others, oh my goodness, that is great and more power to me and what I can do. But also there are some topics that need more time to process and need yeah. more time to feel. And it's it comes to this tricky place of how can I hold the space for myself and others at the same time? And there's has to be a little bit of priorities there. And I think that's not to say that I'm not prioritizing other people who are following our content um, at all, but it's more of how can I make sure that I'm prioritizing what I need to first so then I can give whatever I need to, to the people who are listening or watching at that time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cause there's, I mean, there's almost nothing worse than impulsively responding. And, and I say nothing worse because of the nature of where the information is going, right? Like it's out there. (laughs) And even if you delete it, someone has screenshotted it. Someone has saved it. Like something is just very (laughs) stress inducing. (laughs) Um, And I, I, I will sort of take us back and, and, and build back to the work, but I think it's relevant to this. The connection is you work a lot with young adults, teens, preteens, kids, where does social media come into play for them? Like, what are some of the common challenges that you're seeing in your sort of general client base as far as either being someone who creates content or just simply consumes it? Because I feel like, and let me just clarify this now, then I'll let you know. It's like, I feel like we're coming into a generation that they almost all can be content creators. Like they're all having this like big pressure to like, you know, I don't know. It just feels different than what we went through. Oh, well, and, well, and you're younger than me, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> really, are you sure? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think like I don't look it. <laughs> I think probably like a good ten years. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I feel like once you get past like twenty-five to forty, like everyone's the same. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I'm I'm in there. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. Okay. Um, but. Um, yeah, I do think it's different. I think it's very different. I mean, I was raised, I remember when Instagram started, like, I remember when Instagram, um, was this new thing and it, we didn't have the comparison quite yet. It was just like, Oh, here's some fun ways to post pictures online. And then we saw Instagram, how it's breeding comparison. And then there was, I think very subtle movements of don't listen to Instagram. Don't compare yourself to the people you see online all that fun stuff. And then TikTok came around many years later. Um, And then TikTok blew up even a few years after that. And TikTok is this place that's different than Instagram in so many ways. Mm -hmm. But I feel like one of the ways, especially this generation is engaging in social media um, at the younger age is that they're having less to compare to. Doesn't mean there's not comparison, but I just know that at least on TikTok, there's this... (laughs) There's this sense of you are allowed to be whatever the heck you want to be and do whatever the heck you want to do. And this may interpret different ways, but quote unquote weirdness is encouraged. And what I mean by that is like, you can post a video of 
putting ketchup on a potato and blowing it up in a microwave. And I, I haven't seen this video, but just making something up and then, you know, throwing it at a tree and then painting on the tree. And it's like, whoa, what is this weird thing? Um, and so it, there's, you know, maybe on Instagram, you couldn't do that. Maybe it's asking more curated. Yeah. And so this is more TikTok is able to be raw. And so I've actually noticed a lot more, a lot more normalcy, I think in terms of how people are engaging in social media of, I feel like I'm allowed to be myself, which is a beautiful feeling to have. Mm -hmm. However, social media as always still consumes a lot of people and comparisons still exist. And so I see people, the people who I work with in particular, using social media as kind of this double-edged sword of it's this great resource now that didn't used to be, mm -hmm. but also if we get on the wrong side of the internet, of course, it can kind of go the other way. So it really depends on how they're engaging. And so I like to encourage individuals who I work with to say, yeah, if you use this as a resource, great, but what types of content are you consuming that you count as a resource? Mm -hmm. And how can we make sure that it is something that is helpful for you instead of something that is breeding whatever types of work that we're trying to work against, bringing more of that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Two questions come to mind. Sure. In the weirdness is encouraged. Is it so far as to say the, like what used to be sort of the stereotypical cool kid is like now the anti, or is it <laughs> still a thing? Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Like, Yes. <laughs> I, I can't fully say uh, that's a great question. And I don't fully have an answer to that because I think it also depends on where you are at. Like I definitely still see the stereotypical cool kid being stereotypically cool with some bully aspects and some saying I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. That absolutely still exists. And I think depending on the type of content that you're engaging in, mm -hmm. you're going to see more of that too. But I also see a sense of it is... So it's going to sound weird, but it's not as cool to be cool. If that yeah. makes sense. It's not this, that yeah, is like, the only way to get traction. Yeah. Like the, um, if, if we think of it as a spectrum, it's like yes. there are, they aren't as far apart anymore. Right. Like they're kind of coming together. <laughs> yeah. That's a perfect way of describing it. Yes. It's like, um, the cooler kids think that they're cooler than everyone, but the rest of the kids are like, nah, you're not that far off. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Uh, all right. And the second question is, are most of your followers kids or adults or a mix? Like where, where does that sit? That's a great question. Part of me, if you're interested, I can check. <laughs> I can pull up statistics and check, but from what I know, I think it's a good mixture of both. I think that I have a lot of people who I would say are under the age of 22, um, who are engaging in my content. Cause a lot of people in that age range are more likely to be online. Yeah. But obviously I'm someone who is older than that. And so are you, and we engage in content online as well. So I would say there's a good healthy mix, um, of all ages. I have people who I know engage who are, much older than I am and people who engage in content who are much younger than I am. So from yeah. what at least I can tell just without looking at numbers exactly, I'd say it's pretty much all over the board. Okay. And I, and I ask um, mainly because it's interesting to me if, if kids say under 22, under 18 in their teens are following therapists, like that's mm -hmm. cool, you know? Um, I yeah. interviewed Jax Anderson, the TikTok mom and psychotherapist. And she's like, I mostly have kids and they send my videos to their parents. I was like, that is wild. <laughs> like, that's <is> awesome. <laughs> oh my goodness. The boldness of kids these days with their mental health. I am so proud of them all. It makes me so happy because yeah, yeah I feel like that's a great example. People have this new boldness and are saying, I actually want to take charge of this. This does not feel right. Let me find a way to fix it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's go back. Why did you get into this work? Why did you become a therapist in the first place? Great question. I can give you the long or short. What do you want? <laughs> yeah, the long. It's good. Yeah. Whatever. So I did not know I wanted to be a therapist. I actually was very against being a therapist um, when I first started my career. 
I knew from a very young age, like 13, I wanted to be in a helping profession. And I actually staged most of my life choices around that goal in mind. So I volunteered all throughout high school and different types of things that would encourage progress in certain social movements that were going on. Um, really one that particularly was of interest to me was an issue around human trafficking. And so that actually got me into the door of social work. So when I went to my undergraduate school, I got my degree in social work and took all the classes that had to revolve around trauma. And I didn't know that at the time, but around mm -hmm. this like idea of people and their resilience and the hard things that they go through. I interned at human trafficking agencies and did a lot of group work there and policy advocacy. Didn't want to touch individual work because I was like, that is too scary. Um, then I spent some time in between my undergraduate degree and graduate degree working internationally um, through Thailand and Myanmar and worked a little bit through human trafficking agencies, but also it's kind of hard to place exactly because it's not a direct translation, but like kind of a foster care agency over there too, with people who have been displaced. And so a little bit of like, if we had to combine in our words, like human trafficking, um, foster care and people who've been refugeed that was kind of where I was working. And so wow. then that sparked other interests in other agencies too. So when I got back to grad school, I again, still said, I don't want to do individual work. I did a little bit of that in Thailand and so was scared. I said, no one wants to listen to me. I don't have this authority. And so I entered into graduate school with a uh, idea of a master's in social work, but a focus in more group policy advocacy, big macro social work stuff. And about a month in, I was like, I miss people. Mm. I think I want to try this out. Mm. And part of what I also wanted to do, it was test myself because I already was really great, greatly, is that the word? Whatever. Goodly trained, greatly trained <laughs> in, in the- Extensively in the, trained. There you go. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> Extensively trained. I was goodly trained. But like, good. that was a better choice. <laughs> I was trained efficiently, yeah. sufficiently in, um, in social work in the broad <laughs> macro world. And I was like, I want to test myself to see if I can do this, this micro stuff. I want to see what I can do. So then I went into micro social work and did therapy in a refugee organization. So it was focused on refugee mental health. And so then I worked with adults, uh, mainly adults, but some teens and kids too. Mm -hmm. And I realized I really like this stuff. I kind of want to keep going with it. And so I, after I had my degree, I then worked at a foster care agency and was the only therapist on the staff. And so I did a combination of case management, but it was mainly, mainly therapeutic interventions and really fell in love with therapy at that moment, really found that I could do this and that the only thing holding me back was my imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and that I really needed to kind of focus, buckle down, continue to get trained. And so that's what I did. And so that's kind of brings me to where I'm at now. I do have my own private practice now and I love what I do. I have no regrets from my training. And it's nice because I do have that previous experience and kind of the macro side of social work. So I know what I'm doing in terms of how do systems interact with each other mm -hmm. and how can we find resources for individuals. Mm -hmm. But then I get to meet them where they're at and find their personal growth and help them in an individual basis. And so that was the long answer of no, how I got good. to therapy, but I love it. Yeah, no, that's great. I, um, I was going to ask, and I think you answered it, but I wonder if there's anything more you want to say about it. Mm -hmm. The fear of doing individual work, yeah. all imposter syndrome, like just really couldn't fathom sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone. I didn't think I was good enough to sit down with someone. I thought that why would anyone count me as an authority? Mm -hmm. um, I also didn't know if that was something I wanted to do, of sit with someone and hear their story for an hour or so. It's like, I, I don't know if I could handle that with, with everyone. Um, not that I say I couldn't handle it, but I was saying like, I don't know if I will be so anxious the whole time, hoping I'm doing enough for them and hoping mm -hmm. I can give them enough support that then I say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And something that I've had to learn is, of course, you're going to say the wrong thing. <laughs> you you are like kind of the point earlier, you're human too. Mm -hmm. So how can you learn to say the wrong thing less mm. and fix your mistakes in the moment? And how can you get trained to be more confident and also know what you're doing, of course, to be able to reach people where they're at 
and also join with them in the fact that sometimes I don't have the answers. And then we can both sit in confusion and normalize. This is a hard thing that not even a trained professional may fully understand, but let's figure it out together. And I'm going to be holding your hand along the ride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I cannot imagine how impactful the work that that you were doing that you mentioned I you know I think you've shared how it impacted you professionally you know how did working with trafficking survivors refugees all of that like how did that impact you personally I loved what I did and I still do my my approach now is obviously much more broad I work with a different population now but I deeply love what I did there and I think that it impacted me personally it made me feel more purposed. It made me feel like this is what I'm meant to be doing, mm -hmm. um, is to work with people who have previously been marginalized and do not have enough resources um, to be able to, to let's say put this, to be able to solve what they are needing help with without help. I don't know if that made sense, but what I mean by that is people who have been a not previously able to grow without assistance mm. for the best way to put that um I mean able to say I may not have all the answers I want to learn your story so then I can help point you in a direction where you might need more support or something that I can help you with and so it was never about let me solve everyone's problems never right, right. <laughs> um because because who am I to be in that position and that's something that I've learned along the way as well but how can I help empower you to know what resources are out there? What ways that you can um, take ownership of this? What ways that we can work through some anxiety to maintain control? Um, and how can we work through the trauma that you've experienced as well and get you to a place of you're able to find healing in all of this? Mm -hmm. So it was, I know I'm kind of talking professionally, but it was so impactful for me personally to say, I see all these amazing individuals and the growth that they are experiencing. And it makes me feel purpose in my work mm -hmm. and also who I am as a human. So don't get me wrong, there were challenges along the way, both with imposter syndrome and with messing up and so many learning growth barriers that I had, but it it was a joy to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I, I was going to ask a question that I think is perhaps just too broad, but I think I might've figured out how to do it. So, so I was going to ask you with those groups of people mm -hmm. overly generalized you know I was going to ask you what would surprise those of us who have not had that experience to know about those who have mm -hmm. and I was thinking about how that's probably too broad of a question but what it really is is the trauma piece mm -hmm. Was there any like common thread line through the different types of experiences or, and, or <laughs> <laughs> anything, those of us who've not had the experience of being where you were, that would be like, whoa, I never would have realized that that is something that <laughs> I've asked you 25 questions now, pick one. All right, pull it, let's go. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I have to think because because that's a brilliant question. I'm I'm tracking with you. I promise. Which one? <laughs> All thirty. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if, if I'm kind of narrowing down your question a bit, I'm kind of please do um, help me. Perfect. <laughs> what I do. Um, the therapist line. I'm hearing you ask. So I'm hearing you ask. <laughs> is what would surprise individuals to maybe know about the shared experience of trauma throughout different? Yes. Different trauma. I think of that caliber right sure, sure sure that makes sense um okay give me a second let me think <laughs> I'm going back racking my mind all the, I'm trying to find all the common threads <laughs> I think I don't know if this is going to directly answer it but it's it's interesting how unique every individual story of trauma is mm. and what I mean by that is there is not one approach to healing. There is not one approach to say, you know, every individual with PTSD is gets relief doing X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately not. I mean, that would make my job a lot easier in <laughs> times of saying, here's a pamphlet, just read it and move on. That would be horrible. But um, 
there's not one approach to healing. And so while there are, I'm sure, common threads throughout trauma of kind of maybe the symptoms around it or the experiences, um, and also the resilience of that, if I can point that out too, I think a very big common thread is the resilience of people who are able to make the effort in their own healing. That's a huge, huge win. And mm-hmm. we don't count that enough of making effort into healing is a huge form of resilience. Mm-hmm. But I think that everyone's story, everyone's way of processing, everyone's experience of trauma is just so different that there's not one one web that I can draw that says, this is the answer, or this is how your experience relates to everyone else. I think if I had to answer your question, it's that the shared experience of trauma is unique. It is very common. I think people aren't also realizing how many people in the world are actually suffering with Mm -hmm. trauma, Mm -hmm. um, both here and otherwise. And there is not one way to heal, but there is healing possible. And I think that when you're able to instill that with individuals to say, hey, here's some hope for your situation, it goes a long way too. Mm -hmm. That's not denying that the hardship exists. It's not saying, oh my goodness, you're going to get better. Don't worry about it. No, (laughs) that is a big, no, no. We don't just say like, it's just going to get better because, you know, oftentimes it doesn't. Like, let's be real. People who are experiencing really difficult moments, it does not get better right away. It doesn't. Um, But when we're able to say, hey, I see you, Mm -hmm. I see your experience. I'm so sorry. And I know how hard that is, even though I'm not personally experienced it, but let me walk alongside you and build that community. It's another big point actually is community goes a long way. Mm -hmm. I think it means a lot. Mm -hmm. It helps with the healing process. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Did that answer sure. the 30 yeah. different answers for 30 years? Like, I, I, I don't even know, but it worked. It was very informative and I appreciate it. Um, well, well, so let's, let's do that in a second. What give, what is a, a working definition that you have of trauma? Love that you asked what I have, cause it's different than other things. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm laughing is because I get that question so much. Trauma is this really funny thing that we often define as a very certain definition. And if we go into like the PTSD world of things, the diagnostic manual that kind of defines what, how trauma looks in your life. And then there's, for lack of a better word, quote unquote, lesser trauma, which does not mean your trauma is any less, but it means that it's not defined in a way like a PTSD traumatic event where it's impacting you for the long term. You can still have trauma without PTSD. So I need that to first be defined. Two different definitions for two different things. I'm happy to give both. The way I define trauma is similar to the way I actually define PTSD um, ish. And I can get into that too. I'm being very confusing, kind of on purpose. <laughs> trauma <laughs> is defined as anything that has impacted you for a long period of time and has stuck with you. It's been that that maybe has scared you, something that maybe has shaped your existence. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, you may not really recognize it as such, but yelling from your parents early on can be, can be traumatic. Mm -hmm. You might then have this, this voice of trauma that every time someone yells at you in a relationship, you're going to say, I'm running, I'm leaving this relationship. This means I'm in danger. Mm -hmm. And while that may not be PTSD in terms of you're having symptoms of that every day, it is still an event that was traumatic for you that has impacted you for the long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I define trauma as anything that's impacted you deeply for a long lasting term that has been hurtful to you. Okay. Similarly with PTSD, I only add to that of, and you're having symptoms on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis that remind you of the trauma or stem from the traumatic event that has happened. Okay. The DSM, which is a diagnostic manual I was talking about, kind of defines PTSD a little bit more specifically, which I don't like. It defines trauma as this life-threatening event where it has to be, I think, perceived or threatened death, Mm -hmm. sexual assault, or um, harm to yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think that like comes with war Mm -hmm. oftentimes. And that really does a really poor job of limiting people's experience with trauma because you might have one of those traumatic events that I talked about at the beginning but you might have those symptoms that are lasting because of it I have so many people where there's many different circumstances where they've experienced um, like foster care for example 
being taken out of your home multiple different times is very traumatic. And that has lifelong, uh, you know, at least lasting events. I mean, I wouldn't say lifelong, but lasting symptoms that stick with you for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different definitions. I hope that made sense, but, yeah. but trauma, I think is more broad than we often let on. Yeah. Yeah. I just, as you're talking, I mean, my immediate response is to want to downplay it, but I think that would be uh, downplay what I'm about to say. I think you would not like that. So I'm going to try not to, but yes. <laughs> you know, uh, my listeners have been on a, a body image journey with me over the last year and really just unpacking diet culture and really like my f relationship with food and all of it. And like, it goes back mm -hmm. to like being six or seven years old, you know? And, and yeah. The fact that I'm now 33 and dealing with this, I'd say it was pretty traumatic, <laughs> you know, like I can't, I can't wake up and not think about it. So <laughs> like, you yeah. know, not life-threatening. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And not to put labels on anything. Cause I definitely don't diagnose unless I, you know, unless a client comes in, but but yeah, that sounds like it has been so traumatic for you to experience and to have that something that's stuck with you since a childhood memory Yeah, impacting and shaping your daily life. Yeah. I, I think that's absolutely a form of, of at least a traumatic event that's stuck with you. Yeah. Sense. All right. So let's, because I think, you know, given where we started this conversation and how in tune you are with social media and things like that, I want to just say this. I think that trauma and the many definitions of them have become, it's become kind of a buzzy word. Yes. And yes. so what, what do you think about that? Like, what do we do about that? Great question. Yeah. I have feelings about this. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard. It's like, it's some, so much of what you see is so well-intentioned. Yes. And then there's things that maybe aren't, <laughs> but, and, and you don't need to speak <laughs> to those. I just, I feel like I like anything, right. Mental health is kind of having a moment on social media right now, sure. which has its great positives. And then you have this other aspect of it, of like trauma boundaries, ADHD are now just like common words that are getting thrown around somewhat sometimes even like sarcastically and it's like wait a minute whoa these used to be words that weren't even part of our vocabulary and now we're throwing them around like what do you think we do about that how do where's the line where's the balance great question I yeah I have feelings about this because we've both come so far and also have so much more to go and what I love that we are doing with using these words as we're creating a sense of normalcy around them of, oh my gosh, yeah, I, have, I got ADHD. I'm so distracted or um, like, yeah, like that's just such a BPD thing for me to do. <laughs> and, and there's, you know, there's <laughs> levels where I'm like, okay, I appreciate that we are making this feel like it is not a stigmatized thing to talk about. Love that. I love releasing the stigma. Um, like I, I think back on uh, Katy Perry's song, I kissed a girl, was it, I think it was a kissed a girl or maybe hot and cold, whatever it was of, of like, you're so bipolar or whatever, yeah. because whatever you're doing, yeah. um, I'm like, that was never okay to begin with. So I'm glad that we're maybe recognizing and calling some of that out and normalizing. Yeah, that's a mental health diagnosis and right. we need to like, seek support for it. Yeah. But there, there's a point where we've kind of taken it a little too far and it's now it's like a trend. Oh my gosh, look at my trauma. Oh my gosh, look at my anxiety that I'm having. And you might have that. I'm not denying that that is someone's experience. Yeah. But when we're overusing it in the terms of uh, like, oh yeah, that's so bipolar or oh, um, that's just PTSD flaring up. That's not how that works. Right. <laughs> That's, that's not how that works. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> um, it, it, and it's so interesting to me how many people have become self-proclaimed and I'm going to say this and I'll clarify self-proclaimed mental health advocates when they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, yes. and I love that we have mental health advocates. I think there is, I'm so supportive of that. Please do not hear that differently. 
But when we have people who have no experience in the mental health field, not really knowing what they're talking about, Mm -hmm. not really knowing what diagnoses mean and the weight of them and Mm -hmm. just kind of throwing out words just to use them, it, it creates problematic. It It creates like almost like a reverse stigma of, of (laughs) saying, I, I know that my experience now isn't bad, which is great, but almost like a, it's, it's tricky to say this but almost like we're making it, let me choose my words here. It's almost like we're making it too. Okay. Let me, let me think and then we'll pause. I I think what you're trying to say and, and let me, you can correct me. Sure. Speaking about cancer is very common, but it's not casual. Correct. I think there's a level of casualty to it. I also think it makes it seem like the symptoms are, this is what I'm trying to say. I think it makes it seem like the symptoms are just something that everyone experiences. And so then it it prevents people from getting the proper mental health care. I see. They're okay. Getting, when they're almost overly diagnosing themselves or other people, um, it kind of limits the uh, support they're able to get. I don't know if that makes sense, yes. but for example, if someone's like, oh my gosh, I couldn't decide on something today, um, must make, I'm so insert the blank here, yes. then someone who actually has that experience of like insert the blank here is like, oh wait, I don't have that symptom. Or maybe I have so many of that and maybe that's supposed to be normal and I don't actually need mental health support. Maybe I just need to get over it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I just need to say like, I just need to do whatever and get through it. And that's like actually not helpful. Yeah. Um, where the reverse stigma comes in of then that person's not feeling like they need extra support and is able to get support from a therapist or psychiatrist or any of the other types of support yeah they're saying oh maybe I don't actually need the help I don't know if that makes sense but yeah that's yeah about. well and I think I think what I'm thinking about too is I feel like who who could be particularly susceptible to that is kids yes right and and the way that you were talking, just the phrase is like, oh, how BPD of me, like it's clear to me how, how often you are interacting with teens because you sound like <laughs> my niece and nephew and I don't, you know, understand half of what they're saying, you know, but yeah, like really susceptible to not, yeah, not processing fully what's, what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you get started working with kids, teens, preteens, like why, why that focus for you? I wish I had a better answer than I love it, but I love working with kids. I think I, I've always known that I, you know, like babysitting growing up, you're like, I'm just good with kids. Like Mm -hmm. I, I can both relate and find ways where I don't personally relate, but I can find ways to kind of go into that headspace of, yes, let's just hang out. Let I meet you where you're at. I'm able to kind of pick up on things quickly. When I was working with the refugee population that was mainly working with adults, I was always nervous that they're this adult, maybe 50, 60 plus, 40, mm-hmm. 30, 40 plus, And I am this 20 something. Right. Like, where is my authority here? What do you know about life? Kind what of do thing? you know about life? And they've had so, you know, so many other experiences and I had to kind of lean on, okay, I'm educated. I know right. what I'm doing and all these other great things that I've paid, you know, too much money for all my licenses for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think, so there's a little bit of, I work with kids cause I don't fully want to work with adults. Um, nothing against working with adults. I've done it before, but I just, I feel more empowered when I work with kids. I feel more like I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. My imposter syndrome is a lot less. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say I don't work with adults because I do. I mean, working with kids, that's the, always the big joke in the therapy realm of uh, if you choose to work with kids, you're choosing to work with adults and families and relationships mm-hmm. and marriage counseling and you do everything. So <laughs> I do technically everything, mm-hmm. but in smaller doses. Okay. So I meet with parents weekly as well and can provide counseling and support for them. But my main focus in that is their child. Right. And so that helps me focus that. Okay. And I saw, um, you know, I've watched your TikToks and talk to me about kind of, you know, the idea of the problematic parent, like what are some do's and don'ts if there's a parent listening and it's going to get their kid into therapy? Like what should they do and what should they not do? 
I love that that's become a theme of my TikTok. <laughs> I have to say that. Um, Cause that's right. I mean, so many of my clients come in um, definitely not all, but so many come in and say, oh my goodness, guess what my parent did today. Mm. And this trauma that I'm experiencing, which we are genuinely working on the trauma, um, is, is coming from my parent and I can't believe I'm realizing that now. And so if, if I could encourage any parents who are listening, who are looking to seek supports for their child is I'd encourage you to listen. I mean, genuinely more than anything, listen, ask what's going on. And if they don't want to tell you respect that. If they do want to tell you, please listen without judgment, without needing an answer either, but just listen because what they're experiencing is invalidated by so many other people. They are so desperate to be validated by you. Mm -hmm. And so you may not agree with them. You may not fully understand what they're saying, but ask questions around that. Ask, how can I understand better? How can I help support you in this journey? I I just encourage you to listen because I notice that that's I wouldn't say the number one problem, but one of the number one problems of the children who I am working with is feeling like their parents won't get it, won't hear them, or won't care. Mm -hmm. We need to prove that's not true. What do you think parents might be unintentionally doing that sends that message? I think it's the way that they respond. So when, let's say, for example, uh, someone is saying, a child is saying, um, I don't really want to go to that place today. Like, I like that's going to really stress me out. I don't really want to experience that today. Um, let's say it's going to school. That's a common one. I don't want to go to school today. Okay, well, why? Why do I want to go to school? Is there something that happened that we need to talk about? Or are we just not feeling up for school? Or do we need a mental health day? Or, you know, let's talk through the why instead of saying, get your butt in the car. Come on. Mm -hmm. Like, let's move. Let's Mm go. Um, let's like, I'm going to ignore the pain point that you're telling me and force you to do something that you're saying is painful for you. Now, granted, I very much understand that kids can sometimes take advantage of saying, I don't want to go to school. So I mean, that's not the best example, Mm -hmm. but when your child is telling you a pain point, please don't ignore it and rush to assume what's wrong. I encourage you to ask. And I think that's sometimes that the point that people are missing of, Hey, I'm sharing with you a point of my pain, where the weight of this wound is, and you're responding in a way that's really dismissive. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you also to think if you're a parent listening, think about what your response is. Does it have to be perfect? No, but should it be showing that you're showing your child that you're trying in a way that they can relate to? Mm -hmm. Actually. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard. It's hard, you know, and I, (laughs) being a parent is hard. Even my two-year-old today, like crying, not wanting to go to camp, not wanting to go to camp. And I know literally like he cries, but the second I leave, he's fine. Yes. And it's brutal because I want to, like, I say to him, like, why don't you want to go to camp? And it's like, you know, he's two, he can't fully do that. But there is that part of me that's like, just get in the car. You're going to get there and you're going to be fine. And I know we're not exactly talking about two-year-olds, but it's like, for sure. it's like, it's hard. It's a fine line between we got to just do what we got to do. And no, really let's sit in this and let's talk about it. And, you know, I think. Absolutely. And and you're right. It is hard. This is not something. And I think that example is, you know, very generalizing. So take it or leave it if it serves you or it doesn't. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's hard when your child is is saying like I don't want to do something or I do want to do something. The and I will also say my response to that question is biased because the children who I work with have experienced heavy loads of trauma. Got it. So if that is my focus, if my if my lens is through I'm working with kids who experience this deep traumatic sure. hurt by their parents. Yes. Okay. There might be parents who are listening like, oh my goodness, is there anything wrong? You might not be. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> um, you might not be. So I mean, I'm thinking of children who are saying um, or maybe even have difficulty without even voicing it of they can't, um, go into a shower or go to the bathroom and the parents like, just get in, come Got on. It. Okay. And there's, like, there's yeah. been an experience there. Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying because Thanks for allowing me to clarify. Yeah. yeah. Cause I think that that's, that's really, yeah, that's the big difference. That's major. Yes. Um, yes. yeah. Okay. So uh, this just prompted a question. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but if we're saying that, a lot of the the kids that you see are coming in 
having experienced trauma, sometimes at the hands of their own parents, Mm -hmm. how are they getting to you? Hmm. Great question. And I'm going to speak. Well, it's going to speak from my experience now, but I can kind of touch base and build. So before where I'm currently at, I was in foster care uh, and worked in the foster care system. So, you know, children didn't have a choice. They were at at a level, at least in my state where we call it um, therapeutic foster care, where they had to get support and they were kind of forced to be there. So we tried to make it as welcoming as fun because they were like, don't want to be there half the time. Mm -hmm. People who come to me now um, are either by their parents noticing symptoms and they're like, we don't know what's happening. Can you help? Or a lot of times I see college age individuals who finally convince their parents to pay for therapy or get help Mm -hmm. um, or post-college to say, Oh, I've noticed all of my trauma from my childhood has caught up to me. I'm really feeling it now. And I'm finally at a place to speak for myself to be able to get the help I need. So if a parent doesn't see or, or denies even the the, the trauma they've experienced, they kind of wait. I'm noticing until we get to college or after college and then we come to therapy. Yeah. Okay. And I, you know, that's interesting because my next question was going to be, I don't know why I keep doing that with you where I'm like <laughs> clarifying the question before I ask it instead of just asking it. it. <laughs> right, on. You have so much experience working within systems and now, you know, you're working with kids and we have this, you, you just said like the way mental health and everything is set up in this country. Like we kind of have to wait sometimes to be older, to have more of ability to advocate for ourselves, to seek help. Like Mm -hmm. this is a big one. Mm -hmm. Like if you could meet, like wave a magic wand on the system, the quote unquote system, Mm -hmm. what do you want to see done differently? (laughs) Oh, love that question. I would just so much. <laughs> you, gave, you gave me power and I could actually implement it and actually everything would work. Yeah, oh, like tomorrow. Oh. And if you there's too many, like pick two, pick three, sure. you know? Uh, yeah, I'll pick, I'll pick a couple. Cause I'm sure there are so many, you know, you know, clarifications needed for everything um, of like what we would do because there's so many different things, but I would make mental health more accessible, period. That is the number one thing I do, whether that would be free, whether that would be subsidized, whether that would be um, more therapist, you know, whatever that would be, I would make mental health extremely accessible because right now it's not. I mean, there are companies that are are trying to make it, you know, free or reduced or um, even seen online. And, you know, those are, those can be great because they allow more people to be seen, but then the quality of therapists may not be the best on there either. And so- if I could wave a magic wand and money was not a problem anymore, I would make mental health a hundred percent more accessible. Um, people could get maybe even like required <laughs> like mental health check-ins. That's my ideal world. Yeah. Making uh, sure people can get the support. Like you're going to go to your primary care doctor once a year for a checkup. Why not also include a mental health therapist in that mix too, yeah. at minimum. Um, I think that would be the biggest thing. I also would encourage another big point is to have everyone be trained and what to look for. What are symptoms that you might be experiencing to say, Hey, I need some extra support in Mm -hmm. including parents and other working professionals of, if I'm noticing a friend, a colleague, a a peer, a child experiencing these things, they might need extra support. And here are ways to know about what's going on for them and how to support them too. Mm -hmm. So if I had to boil it down to two things, it would be accessibility and education. Mm -hmm. Um, And then overall being awareness of everything that's going on. Yeah. I think it was maybe might've been a TikTok. I don't recall. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was, it was basically someone in the field saying, don't get me wrong. I love everything we're doing about encouraging more people to start therapy. She's like, but the way the system is, if everyone we were trying to encourage to start therapy actually went and did it, the system would crumble. Absolutely. Like we're not equipped to actually handle everyone's in therapy. Like, like, great, don't stop. But ah, like we need to actually start building the system up a little bit, you know, like it's not a little bit, a lot, (laughs) but I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, even on the therapist side, I can speak to that and I'm speaking client for a lot, but on the therapist side, there's a huge barrier to entry. 
and both rightfully there should be. We don't want anyone and everyone being like, yeah, I'm a therapist today. Tell me what's going on. But the barrier to entry is so high. And, and I'm a social worker first. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And when I was going through school and getting my license and my trainings and all of these fun things, my friends all were like, what the heck are you doing? Mm. This is so expensive. This is so time consuming. This is taking over your life. And I'm like, yes, I love it. Let's keep going with it. But if you don't have the the energy and the commitment and passion's part of it too, but it's really just like the time and the resources to be a social worker or another therapist, you can't, you have to have mm a bachelor's, a master's training alongside of that, um, two years postgraduate at minimum, it's really two to five of clinical supervised training, a certain amount of hours. You have to pay for that training every week. Mm -hmm. You have to pay for your internship. You have to then pay hundreds of dollars for a test you have to take and continued ed education every two years. Granted, do I think those things should be in place? Yes. It helps weed out a little bit of people who are not there for the right reasons or which is a hard thing to do because you sound like you're making loads of money over here. But, um, it, you know, it weeds people out who would not be the best fit, sure. But it's also, there's a huge barrier to entry. So I think that's a great point of if everyone were able to get help while we love that, there aren't enough people who are able to help. Yeah. And that's a very big part of the issue too. Maybe that's a fourth thing I, I would add. Yeah. 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 Well, and it, it's like everything that you said, I, I agree with as far as those those processes should be there right like we want people to be educated we want this and that but the difference right is that we put medical doctors through all of that but then we give them a lot of money at the end of it <laughs> like we're not doing that for therapists we're not doing that for our teachers we're not doing it for a really like very large populations of people who are doing great work that and whose yeah. work matters, if I can clarify, because I love that you like included teachers because mm -hmm. they are so, so yes, in the same boat of yeah. people who are overworked and underpaid and have to go through training. And I mean, and there's a shortage of them right now. Yes. I mean, rightfully so. They're not being paid enough and they're on the front lines. Like I get so many of my referrals from teachers who are mm -hmm. saying, I'm noticing this, this person isn't performing as well. Can you please assist? Because I think they might need support with their mental health. I have of, of clients in the past who've had to report, you know, abuse that's happening to teachers first. These are people who are doing hard, even mental health work. And yeah, I can get a whole soapbox. About I know, that. But, I know. I took but, it yeah. down a road. <laughs> so oh, I love it. I'll, I'll pause there. But, but yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, it's very clear in this world. And maybe, you know, I could just speak at least my experience in the U S it's very clear what matters and what we're prioritizing here. And that can be hard at times to, to yeah. recognize that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to try to transition and wrap us up by saying, yes, it's clear what the U S prioritizes. Now, Maddie, how do you prioritize yourself? What are your self-care practices? <laughs> you like that? Did. that was golden. I love it. Um, my self-care <laughs> variety of things right now what's going on I love to always say we want to build like a self-care arsenal like mm -hmm. we I like to call it like a coping skills toolbox or you know a self-care backpack where like whenever you need a skill you pull it out of your toolbox or backpack and say here it is let me use it so I have some of the basic ones which I, mean a lot to me and are great of I love a good relaxing day of doing nothing or lighting candles or a massage or something else that just makes me feel really at ease and grounded. I, I do connect deeply with that. Um, I know that's not something I can do all the time, full time and money wise. But what I like to do in the meantime is I love my dog. So puppy snuggles are a real thing and they help when I'm going through something difficult. Mm -hmm. um, taking a walk to kind of clear my mind absolutely does some help. Sometimes just zoning out and taking a day to say like, I need to just turn on some Netflix and not think of anything, not the level of dissociating, but more just zoning out and saying, this is too much. I need to just cool my body down. And I like to say, I told someone this other day, there are different types of rest and you have to figure out what type of rest that you are needing to be able to accommodate that. For example, if you're tired and it might be more of a mental tired than a physical tired, you might still try to sleep and you're like, oh, that felt great. 
didn't help me. I'm still tired. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't address the right kind of, sorry. That's because we didn't address the right kind of, of, of exhaustion. So those are some of the things I do. I do have my own supports though. I'm a therapist who sees a therapist. I think I may have mentioned that Mm -hmm. I am someone who has my own uh, friends that I'm able to talk to and support me through difficult times. So I have to invest in community as community is investing in me and do a plethora of things to, to keep me, keep me in my field and also keep my mental health in check. Nice. All right. Well, Maddie, I'm sure that if I asked another question, we'd be here for another three hours. So I will wrap it here, but I appreciate you so much and your time. And this was excellent. And uh, of course I will link every avenue to reach you on show notes and I'll continue following. So thank you. Sounds good. It was such a joy and honor. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. I love Maddie. I mean, I've always loved Maddie. As I mentioned, I follow her on social media, specifically TikTok. She also just reminds me of my niece. So Maddie, I, that's lucky you. I guess I have a special place in my heart for you because every time I see you or hear you talk, I think of my niece. So anyway, I've always enjoyed how genuine Maddie is across all of her platforms. What you see is what you get, which also makes complete sense to me why she sees herself and truly is someone who can relate to kids. Her energy, her vibe, all of it aligned to make a really nice fuzzy place to open up to. I am so appreciative of her grace in answering my, at times, very fumbly and strangely worded questions and for helping me through the things I don't know about trauma. Her work in foster care agencies, human trafficking safe homes, and refugee mental health clinics is absolutely fascinating to learn about, and I am so grateful that she took time to share it. And Maddie, thank you for just being as open and honest as you were about your experience as a content creator and a therapist on social media. I know for me, I know for all the other creators that I talk to and follow, it always helps to hear that we're all going through the same stuff, that it's not all sunshine and rainbows. And just a reminder for anyone listening, any creator you follow, or if you yourself are a creator, they're human beings. Behind all the editing, the captions, and the fancy transitions, there is a human being there that's going to mess up sometimes, that's going to have really great moments and not great moments, and we're all human. So anyway, thank you, Maddie, so much for your time. I look forward to following along your journey, wherever your five-year plan takes you. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Sass Says is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sasssays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later. Talk later.